Okay, let's begin our discussion of the final examination uh, that you will be taking here shortly for the CS 208 Discrete Mathematics course. I uh, want to go through some logistics, make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of the expectations of this final exam. Your final exam is scheduled from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, July the 17th. So uh, you have that time frame to come in and take the final. The final must be done inside of the classroom. It will be IP restricted as well as password protected. No different than week one through week seven's quizzes that we've taken previously. So you cannot uh, get to the final exam remotely. You must take it with me this particular evening. Folks, you have one hour to complete the final exam. So uh, for those that traditionally have showed up late, this is not the night to show up late for this particular final because you only get the difference of when you show up and 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, July the 17th. For example, if you show up at 6 p.m. or you show up and you end up leaving for five, 10 minutes, Whatever the case is, if you are not logged in, ready to go at 5.30 p.m. Central Time uh, on Thursday, the 27th of July, you do not get the full hour to complete it. You will only get the difference between when you are logged in, ready to go, and 6.30 p.m. So, for example, if you're ready to go at 6 p.m. Central Time on Thursday, July the 27th, uh, you only get between 6 and 6.30 to complete that final examination. So again, if you want the full hour to complete the final, you need to be in attendance ready to go at 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, July the 27th. If you do not take the final examination with me uh, on Thursday, July the 27th, it will be recorded as a zero. Or if you show up after 6.30 that night, also a zero. This was clearly defined in the expectations inside of the statement of understanding that you did to get into unit one inside of the Canvas class portal. So everyone in the course has completed that statement and I'd be more than willing to review that with you if you have any questions or concerns about it. But again, if it is not completed by Thursday, uh, July the 27th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, a zero is recorded for the final examination. Some other points as well. You are allowed any notes. It is open book, open note. You can use the Zybook. We also have engaged Microsoft Excel inside of this course. You're welcome and free to utilize that. You're allowed any scientific or graphing calculator that you want to use. That is perfectly fine as well. The, uh, the only thing that you will not be able to use as a smart device is your cell phone, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. I get asked how many questions are actually on the final. There are a total of 17. 17 that would be coming potentially from what I'm gonna cover inside of this review. Last two bullet points here, your cell phone must be turned off during the scope of the final. If I see you use your cell phone, if I hear your cell phone go off, a zero will be administered on the final examination. So again, I want to make sure everybody is aware of that expectation. Cell phone is an external means of communicating during the final exam. And again, I do not allow that during the scope of the final. If I see, hear, look, you're looking at your cell phone, a zero will be administered on the final examination. No exceptions to that. The last bullet point, I'm covering a representative sample of the types of problems that you will see on the final exam, but I do not guarantee that 100% of it has been covered. It should be a pretty good representative sample as I just made mention here, but I do not guarantee 100%. So can't come back to me and say, Mike, Mr. Weeman, you didn't cover problem number 13 in the review. Anything from quiz one through quiz 14 that we've done week one through week seven is fair game for the final examination. However, I've tried to do a good representative sample of the questions that you'll be presented with, but I in no means guarantee 100% of it's co uh, covered inside of this review. That is why it is open book, open notes. 
from uh, the administration of this given final exam. So just want to make sure, again, everybody's on the same page relative to that expectation. All right, let's go ahead and begin our review. The first question we've got here, prove or disprove P implies Q or not Q and P is a tautology. So get my pen here started. And what I want to do from a tautology perspective, all of the lines in the true table must come back as a true statement. So this is what I want to prove or disprove if this statement is a tautology. You'll notice I have P and Q as a distinct list of propositions or variables here. If you recall back week one, we said two to the distinct list ends up giving us four lines inside of the truth table. So I'm going to set up my corresponding uh, truth table, P and Q. Half of four is two. So I go true, true, then false, false, and then alternate two by one. True, false, true, false. The goal is when all said and done, when I evaluate this uh, compound preposition, I should show all trues if this is a tautology. So let's go ahead and take care of the first parenthesis here. P implies Q. True implies true is a truth. True implies false is a false. False implies true is a truth. False implies false is also a true. Again, implication and all of the different rules. If you go back to unit one, I had all of the listing of implication, conjunction, disjunction, all of those guys listed in terms of what the results are. So now I'm going to evaluate not Q and P. So in this case, I'm going to negate Q and do the intersection or the uh, conjunction rather in this case. So not Q is going to make that false, false and true is false. And let's see here. Uh, let's see, not false is true. True and true is true. Not true is false. False and false is false. And last but not least, not false is true. True and false is false. Now, the last piece of this, let me change my color, is to do the union as the remaining step. If I apply true or false, the result is true. False or true is a true. True or false is also a true. True or false is a true. So hence, you have all true statements listed there in blue as the final value. Therefore, this is a tautology. So that completes question number one. Let's look at question number two here. Question number two asks us to prove or disprove not P or Q and not P if and only if Q is a contradiction. For a contradiction, this time I'm looking for all false values when I evaluate this truth table. So we'll start out again since I have P and Q, just like in problem number one, two squared equals four. So again, I'm going to list out my truth table in the same manner. I'm going to have true, true, false, false. And then for the Q, I'm going to do true, false, true, false as my initial setup. So first thing I want to do is evaluate. And let me erase that because I didn't want. Pen back. We're going to do P or Q first. So. In this particular instance, the only time uh, an or or a disjunction is false is if both statements are false. So the last line is going to be false. The remaining lines are going to be true when I evaluate the inside of the parentheses. Now I'm going to go ahead and evaluate the inside of the parentheses of not P, if and only if Q. So we're going to take care of that piece. So. Uh, first thing, we're going to negate P. And remember with if and only if, or uh, uh, in this particular case, if they're the same, 
it's true. If they're different, it's false. So once I see a false here, not true is false. False if and only if true is going to yield a false statement. Uh, negation of P, false. If and only if false, they're the same. We end up with true. Uh, negation of false is true. Notice now they, they're the same because I negation of false is true. If and only if true, they're the same, comes true. Negation of false is a true, so now they're different. I end up with false. So now, changing the color here, I'm going to now take a look at the negation, what I've got listed in red, and apply conjunction or the and between it. So remember with an and statement, once you see a false, the entire statement is false. So the negation of true here is false. It's going to make it false regardless. Negation of true again is false. Once I see false, it's false. Negation of true is false. Makes it false. Negation of false is true. However, the false over here is going to make that false as well. Notice all four of those come back as false. Hence, we have a contradiction on problem number two. For problem number three, we need to show logical equivalence. Logical equivalence is going to require that what I have listed in red, the result of that truth table, must yield the same result as what I'm going to do in blue. So the first thing I'm going to illustrate here, i change my color back to red, is set up P implies Q. Well, to set up P implies Q, I've got P, Q, and the setup of P implies Q here. So two distinct variables, four lines in the truth table. True, true, false, false, and again, true, false, true, false. This should be a direct copy of your notes back from week one or unit one. True implies true is the truth. True implies false is a false. All the others should be true. So when all said and done, I should get true, false, true, true as the result of evaluating what's going to be here inside of blue. So I'm going to set up again two variables, four lines in the truth table. So I got P, Q, and in this case, not P or Q. So again, two lines, true, true, false, false. And now we do true, false, true, false. Negation of P, false, implies true, is a truth. Uh, let's see here. Negation of P is false. False implies false is a truth. True implies true, because I'm negating false in this case. Uh, in this instance, true implies true is a truth. Not false is true. True implies false is a false statement. You're going to notice in this particular case that the line here does not match identically to this. In this instance, these two are not logically equivalent. So from a final perspective, you may be asked to show or prove or disprove whether it is or is not logically equivalent. If I would have gotten true, false, true, true when I evaluated this, I would have gotten logical equivalence. But in this case, this one is not logically equivalent. That takes care of problem number three. Let's take a look at problem number four, another example of proving logical equivalence. Uh, again, this one on the left I'll do in blue. The next one I will do in red here. So we'll see if this is logically equivalent or not. So on the first one, we've got, nope, oh, I wanted that to be blue on the first one. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. Make that blue. Here we go. Okay, so two distinct variables, four lines in the truth table. P, Q, not P implies Q. So again, true, true, 
false, false, true, false, true, false. So true implies true is a truth, but notice you're negating the outside. The first line becomes false. True implies false is a false, but you negate the false, becomes true. False implies true is a truth, negate it, is false. False implies false is a truth, negate it, is false. So on this one, we'll see if we end up with false, true, false, false, when I evaluate what's listed here in red. So let's take care of that one. So in this one, again, we're going to set up the P, Q, and we'll go ahead, let's see, P in this case, true, true, false, false, and for Q, we got true, false, true, false. So first thing I want to do is the inside of the parentheses, P or Q. Only time an or statement is false is when both are false. So I'm going to go ahead and make the, first, the last one there false. The other three are going to be true. Now I'm going to bring over negation of Q. Negation of Q, I'm flipping the trues to falses and the falses to true. So we got a false, a true, a false, and a true. Now I want to take the intersection between here and there. Well, false and true is false. This is my final answer. True and true is true. False and true is a false, and true and false is also a false. Notice the values here, I've just circled in purple, match identically to what's listed as my final answer there. Hence, this is an example to where they are logically equivalent. That takes care of problem number four for us. Problem number five, P is false, Q is false, R is true. Evaluate this expression here. So first thing I want to do is P was given as false. I'm going to make that false implies Q, Q is false. Or, well, R was true, the negation of R, if I started with true, is going to make that a false statement. False or false is going to evaluate as true, because I have to take care of what's inside of the parentheses first. So now I'm evaluating true or false. True or false comes back as true as the final answer to problem number five. Number six. How many rows are in this truth table? Well, let's create a distinct list of the variables here. I have a P, I have an R. Not P is still using P as the variable. The negation doesn't impact it. And I've got Q. So if I do the cardinality of that set, I end up with three. Again, our general formula was two to the N. Two to the third power results in eight rows inside of this truth table for problem number six. Number seven, in the case where the theorem being proved is not Q implies not P, how do you prove something by contrapositive? If you recall, in implication or an if-then statement, P implies Q is the original if-then statement. Converse was we uh, Flip the order. Inverse, we negate the original statement. So that would have been not P implies not Q. For contrapositive, we would end up doing both. Flipping the order as well as negating both of the statements. So this first step would be to negate not P, and then the second, then negate not Q. Again, that symbol there, the lopsided L is also the same as the tilde that's listed there. So uh, again, contrapositive, you flip flop and negate. So you would have negated not P, then would have negated not Q statement 
to prove by contrapositive. That takes care of problem number seven. Let's look at number eight. We're going to prove or disprove A union B difference A equals A union B. I want to refer you back to section 3.5 inside of the Zybook. The Zybook has a series of rules that allow us to do operations on sets. So the first one here is we're going to start out with A union B minus A. That is our given statement. I'm going to try to attempt to see if I can end up with A union B as the result in this case. So let's see what happens. Well, in this instance, the first thing I want to do is the work inside of the parentheses. By the property of difference, you're going to notice that this is going to be the same as me writing this in B and not in A. So that's by property of difference. The next piece on this is I want to flip-flop the order of the B and the A complement, or not A. So I'm going to rewrite this as A union A complement and B. And what allows me to do that is by property of commutativity. Commutativity allows me to rewrite an AND statement back and forth. Now I want to group the parentheses on the first two terms. By associativity, I'm going to rewrite this as A union A complement and B. Well, at this point, I now have a statement here that I want to look at on the inside of the parentheses. If you take A union A complement, you get the universe back. So you get universe and B. So, and that was by domination inside of section 3.5. And the last but not least, if you take the universe and B, you end up getting B back by identity property. Now, you'll notice once we simplified it, I got B here. But my final answer should have been A union B. I don't end up with the same thing. So I disproved this identity set from section 3.5, completing problem number eight. Let's look at problem number nine here. I'm asked to evaluate A and B union C based upon the given values here. So. Let's look at A union B. I only will return those values inside the parentheses here if they are common. So you'll notice I have two in both A and B. So my first set, I'm going to start out with a two. I now go to four. Well, four doesn't exist over here, so I'm not going to write it down. I have a five. Five exists in both. I return it back. Now I look at seven. There's a seven here a seven there, I return it, an eight over here, but it doesn't exist over here, don't return it, and then the nine exists in both, so I return it. Now I'm going to bring down C. Notice C has four and seven. For a union, you're going to list out a distinct list of all of the items. So I'm going to always write down in a union the first set, and then from there, anything that I didn't list the first go around. Now, four was not listed, so I write it down. Notice the seven is already there, so I don't write that guy down again. So those five elements make the result to problem number nine. Let's take a look at problem number 10. I'm given this set. I want to determine what's its cardinality. Cardinality has to be listed as a unique grouping or subset contained inside of the set. So here's what I want to do. A is one of them, so that's my first one. So I took care of that one. B, so we got that listed. C, D, E, that's a grouping. B, D, that's a grouping. B, notice B is already listed, so I'm not going to write that down again. 
That is a duplicate. That's a dupe. C, I don't have in my listing, in my distinct listing, so I took care of that. B, D, E, I don't have listed, so B, D, E. So let's count. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. The cardinality of this set is six, completing number 10. Number 11, this guy here, probably not as super clear, but it is the floor function. Floor function, if I look at from a number line perspective, I got the value of negative 6.1. Well, the value on the left would be negative 7, negative 8. For a floor function, which this is what this is, you always go to the left. So in this case, what is the value on this guy? And I apologize, this guy should say negative 6. So negative 7, negative 6, I always go to the left. I end up with the value as the correct answer on this one being negative 7. Now, if this guy would have been this at negative 6.1, in this instance, this is the ceiling here. From a ceiling perspective, you always go to the right. So looking at this, I would have used the value that would have been on the right and would have gotten for that problem a negative six. So the floor, you always go to the left digit. As far as from an integer perspective, the ceiling, you go to the right. Completing number 11 and an additional example there on that problem. Number 12, we're wanting to do the many terms from the given table. And the only ones that I want to use are when the output is one. So I want to use that guy. I want to use that guy. I want to use, since it's got a one in that final column, I want to use that. And I want to use that. So I'm going to work with zero, one, zero. If it's a zero, you put the complement over the top. If it's one, you just write out the variable as is. So the first one, I'm going to do x naught, y, z naught. The second one is going to be x, y naught, z naught. This one here, x, y, z naught. And the last one, x, y, z. So. We end up adding these results together. So I have x naught, y, z naught, plus x, y naught, z naught, plus x, y, z naught, plus x, y, z, completing problem number 12. Looking at problems number 13 and 14, we are asked to determine if something is in disjunctive normal form. From a disjunctive normal form perspective, you cannot have parentheses embedded inside of disjunctive normal form and or you cannot have a full complement uh, associated over a grouping of terms. Again, this was discussed back week three and week four. Go ahead and take a look at your notes. I have a uh, Word or a PDF file that's out there that goes through the different rules of both disjunctive normal form and conjunctive normal form. For this guy, this is disjunctive normal form. Notice this, uh, the terms are separated by the or representing plus and the product representing an and. You can have a comp, you can have a complement with just a single term like that. This guy fails because the complement is over the or. That is what's causing that line over the top to fail on problem number 14. That completes those two problems. Let's look at number 15. It says in a directed graph that has five edges, what is the sum of all the out degrees of the vertices inside the graph? The amount of edges must equal all of the out degrees. So these two are going to equal each other. We end up with five as the correct answer to problem number 15. Looking we'll at number 16, we're asked to determine the big O notation on this polynomial. If you recall and look back at your notes from week three, week four time frame, 
we had discussed that the term with the highest power associated from an exponent perspective is going to be the dominating term. In this particular case, the big O of f to the uh, of f of n, this particular function, is going to be the term that involves n cubed. So, if you were to evaluate and set up the table similar to what I did back in demonstration, you're going to see that this 5n cubed term is going to be the dominating term out of those three. Hence, we end up with n cubed as the evaluation of the big O notation on this one. Looking at number 17, which of the following describes this sequence? Notice the values are decreasing. So this is considered to be a decreasing sequence. We uh, had other examples that we may look at, three, five, seven, nine. That is an example of increasing. If that was asked, if we had three, 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 this one is neither decreasing nor increasing. So that takes care of problem number 17 here. Okay, let's look at number 18. We're given x sub zero at four. The recursive relation x sub n equal two times x sub n minus one minus three. What's the value of x sub three? Well, we're going to go ahead and set up uh, our process here. x sub zero is four. X sub one is going to be taken from this expression right here. So X sub one is gonna be two times X sub zero minus three. Well, from our previous statement, we know what X sub zero is, that becomes four. So if I simplify this expression, two times four is eight minus three equals five. And now we can look at X sub two. Well, x sub 2 is going to follow the same pattern two times the previous minus 3. Our previous value is 5 minus 3. So 2 times 5 is 10 minus 3 is 7. And I've got one more to go to evaluate x sub 3. x sub 3, 2 times x sub 2 minus 2. So 2 times the previous value, which was 7 minus 3. 2 times 7, 14 minus 3. We end up with 11 as our final answer to problem number 18. All right, let's look at number 19. It says substitute the variable i with j equals i plus 4. So in other words, I want to convert all the variables from i to j in this case in this summation. So I'm starting out with i equals 5 to 18 of the expression i plus 5. Well, the first thing that we were told was j equals i plus 4. Well, if I do some algebra and I get i exclusively by itself, that requires that I subtract 4 on both sides. So anytime I see an i, I'm going to make it j minus 4. So uh, I'm going to come back and let's take care of the, the base here, the i. I is going to be the same as saying j minus 4. Because notice anytime I see an I, I'm going to make it j minus 4 here plus 5. Well, I equals 5 on the bottom or the lower bound. So if I come over here and I say, okay, j equals I plus 4. If I equals 5, 5 plus 4 is going to make j equal to 9. So j is going to be 9 in the denominator. Same song, different verse. Again, using the statement j equals i plus 4. The upper bound started with 18 as your i value. So I need to make that 18 plus 4. Well, 18 plus 4 is 22. So my upper bound is going to be 22 this time. Simplify the expression minus 4 plus 5. We'll make our final answer summation j equals 9 to 22 minus 4 plus 5 is going to make that 1. So end up with summation j equals 9 to 22 of j plus 1, completing problem number 19. 
Let's look at problem number 20. He asks us to do the sigma or the summation from k equals 3 to 7 of 2k minus 3. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a handy dandy little chart here of k and 2k minus 3. What can k take values from? It starts at 3 and can go all the way up to the upper bound of 7. So 4, 5, 6, and 7. In this expression, wherever there's a k, I'm going to plug in whatever's on that line. So 2 times 3 minus 3, 2 times 4 minus 3, 2 times 5 minus 3, 2 times 6 minus 3, and 2 times 7 minus 3. Well, 2 times 3 is 6 minus 3. I get 3. 2 times 4 is 8 minus 3 is 5. 2 times 5, 10 minus 3 is 7. 2 times 6 is 12 minus 3 is 9. 2 times 7, 14 minus 3, I end up with 11. What I need to finally do now is add those results that I did on the four or five lines. So 3 and 5 were at 8, 7 were at 15, 15 and 9, 24, 24 and 11. Grand total, if I sum up those values, at 35 as the correct answer to problem number 20. Number 21 should look very familiar because I have it in here twice. I'm going to say C number 18 because I just did this problem a minute ago and not going to redo my uh, review sheet. So uh, this is C number 18 inside of the recording. Okay, for number 22, we are asked to find the modulus or the remainder associated with 91 mod 3. Now, if you recall, when we talked about modulus back in the course, that modulus can only take on a positive value. So, uh, one of two ways we could approach this one. When it's a positive value, we go back to traditional mathematics to accomplish this. We determine 3 goes into 91, well, 3 goes into 9 three times, 3 goes into 1 zero times, and you end up with 1 as your remainder. So this evaluates to 1 as the correct answer. The other way we could have done this is by the division algorithm that states N equals QD plus R. N is your initial value you're starting with. Q is referred to as your quotient. D is your divisor. And R is your corresponding remainder. Now, for this one, you'll notice in this case, our initial value is 91. We ended up doing the division and we came up with 30 as the quotient, because that's what we got there, 30 is the quotient. The divisor is my three. To make this a true statement, I have to add one to it, which the one there as the R serves as the remainder to the problem. Now what we're going to see in problem 22, or excuse me, 23 here, is when you end up with a negative remainder, how do you handle that? We'll cover that here shortly. Okay, for problem number 23 here, you'll notice our initial value starts out as negative. This is going to require some manipulation to get our remainder to be positive. This one was discussed back week four, week five time frame. But let's set up our initial n equals qd plus r. There's my n. There is my divisor. So let's see here. Negative 91. We already did the division on this one, but it ends up to be negative this time. We end up with negative 30 times 3, but to make this a true statement, it's negative 1. Remember, we stated that remainders have to be positive. You cannot have a negative remainder. So the question becomes is, how do I get that guy to be positive? If I add 3 here, that requires that I'm going to subtract the quotient by 1. So notice if I do that, I get negative 91 equals negative 31 times 3. Well, if you take negative 31 times 3, 
you get negative 93. To get this guy to 91, you have to add a positive 2 to get it back to a positive value. Hence, the modulus on this one is 2 as our correct answer. Completing question number 23. Looking at number 24 here, again, working with modulus, we have 91 to the 51st power times 66 to the 34th power, modulus 5. If you recall, when we did one similar to this back week four, week five time frame, we looked at evaluating each of the individual moduluses first. So I want to look at 91 mod 5 and 66 mod 5 first. Well, if I perform 5 going into 91, that's going to go 18 times with a remainder of 1. So 91 mod 5 is going to be 1 in this case. 66 mod 5, again, if I do the 5 going into 66, is going to go what? 13 times 65, again, with a remainder of 1. So 91 to the 51st power is going to be the same as me saying 1 to the 51st times, because 66 mod 5 is also 1, 1 to the 34th mod 5. Well, 1 to any power is just simply 1. 1 to any power is simply 1 mod 5. 1 times 1 is 1. And if you evaluate 1 mod 5, you end up with 1 as your correct answer in this case. Completing number 24. Number 25, find the least common multiple and greatest common divisor of 1840 and 910. Well, let's go ahead and we'll start with 1840 and find its prime factorization. Well, it's even, so it's going to be divisible by 2. Again, still even, divisible by 2. 2 goes into 9 four times, so I believe we get 460. Again, divisible by 2, we get 230. And again, divisible by 2, so 115. Ends in a 5, so it's divisible by 5. 5 goes into 11 twice, and so we're at 15. 5 goes into 15 23 times. I now am going to use... The 23, the 5, and the 4 twos to set up my corresponding prime factorization on it. So uh, for the value of 1840, that is going to end up to be a 2, a 2, a 2, a 2, a 5, and a 23. And again, all those are multiplied together. Now I'm going to do the same thing for 910. It's even, so it's divisible by 2. 2 goes into 9 4 times. 2 goes into 11 5 times. And 2 goes into 10 5 times. So I'm at 455. It ends in 5, so it's divisible by 5. 5 goes into 45 9 times. 5 goes into 5 once. And let's see, I believe 7 is going to work here. 7 goes into 9 once. 7 goes into 21 13 times. So I end up with a 2, a 5, a 7, and a 13. So for the values of 910, I'm going to try to reuse a column if I can. Otherwise, I'm going to tack it off to the right here. So for 910, I have a 2, so I'm going to reuse it. A 5, reuse it. So that took care of that one. A 7, I don't have. I'm not going to, I'll tack it off to the right. And then the 13 doesn't exist in the first number, so I'm going to tack that off to the right. So that I end up setting this up in that manner. Well, to figure out the GCD, and let me change the color here. To figure out GCD, it has to exist in both. So when it exists in both, notice that one, and that one exists in both of the numbers. Hence, if I take the product of 2 times 5, I end up with 10 as the greatest common divisor. Now, for the least common multiple, which is going to be in this purple color, I bring down everything. 
as a distinct list of columns. So notice I'm writing out every single thing here. So I have the column for the twos, second column for the twos, third column for the twos, fourth column for the twos, the five, the 23, the seven, and the 13. So I'm gonna two to the, uh, just pull out my calculator here and let me move this guy over so we can actually see. Just a second. Okay, so I'm gonna key in two times two times two times two times five times 23 times seven times 13. I end up with 167,440 as the least common multiple, completing number 25. Okay, for number 26, how many 8-bit strings have exactly three zeros? You're choosing three zeros out of the total eight, so we can do combination on this one to allow us to do this particular one. So I'm calculating combination of eight comma three, you can use Pascal's triangle or do this by hand. If you recall, if you do this by hand, combination n choose r is n factorial over n minus r factorial times r factorial. So wherever I see an n, I'm gonna plug in eight. Wherever I see an r, I'm gonna plug in three. So this becomes eight factorial, eight minus three factorial, three factorial. Simplify this, we end up with eight factorial. Eight minus three is five factorial, three factorial. Counting down the eight, I go eight, seven, six, stop at five factorial. Notice I have, so that took care of the eight factorial, the five factorial, I bring over. If I evaluate three factorial, that is the same as one times two times three which is six, I'm gonna put the six underneath the six because notice the sixes cancel and the five factorials cancel. All that is left is the eight times seven. We end up with 56 as the correct answer to this problem. The alternative way you could have done this problem was to open up Microsoft Excel and notice what I am typing in here. The intrinsic or the built-in function for combination, you would start with an equals, C-O-M-B-I-N, open parenthesis, notice my N was eight, my R was three. They're separated by a comma, close the parenthesis, notice we end up with 56 as our correct answer as well. So you could do it by hand or utilize Microsoft Excel. If you have a scientific calculator that is not your smartphone, either your iPhone or your Android, your Blackberry, whatever you use, as your phone, you can utilize that scientific calculator, but you cannot use your, calcul uh, your smartphone as your calculator for the final examination. That takes care of that problem. Looking at problem number 27 here, 27 says, how many different seven digit numbers can be formed utilizing the digits in the number 9299929? Well, First thing I want to do is, since I have repetition this time, I have to do this in two parts. If you recall back uh, week six time frame, I showed repetition as far as from counting technique, either week five or week six. So step one, I need to evaluate the length of this number. Well, it's not actually seven digit numbers we've got. Well, it actually is, I apologize. Seven digit number, because you got your millions, three there, three there for a total of seven. So you're gonna apply the length of the number and apply its factorial. So that's step one. Step two, we're gonna create a distinct list of the digits. So for this guy here, I have a two and I have a nine. Well, for twos, let's count how many twos are in the number. Well, there's one, two of them, so I have a total of two twos. So this is our count column. The count or the frequency of how many. For the nines, that's all the other digits. That's the one, two, three, four, five of them. So I have five factorial as that. The remaining step three, 
you take step one's result and divide it by step two's result. Well, step one was seven factorial. Step two was the product of all of our step two. So two factorial, five factorial. I'm gonna go ahead and complete this one by hand. You can do this inside of Excel if you want to. So counting down from seven, I've got seven, six, five factorial. So that takes care of the seven factorial. The five factorial I bring over. Well, two factorial is the same as one times two, which is two. So for the two factorial, I bring over a two. Notice the five factorials uh, cancel out. Seven times six is 42. Divide that guy by two, you end up with 21 as the correct answer to problem number 27. Let's look at problem number 28. It says a group of six members elect a president and vice president. No member can hold more than one uh, position. How many ways are there to select the group officers? So I have a uh, vice president. I have a president bucket and I have a vice president bucket. Let me clean that up here. There we go. Okay, so president, vice president. Initially, you have six to choose from. So six has the options for the president. For vice president, both the president and the vice president can't be the same person. So I have to decrease that count by one and I'm at five. Your group's gotta consist of the president and the vice president. Remember from a counting perspective, anytime you have the word and, you have to multiply. So in this case, I'm gonna take the six times five ends up with 30 as the correct answer to problem number 28. Looking at number 29, it says a group of seven members elect a president and vice president. No member can hold more than one position. In the seven member group, four are girls and three are boys. So I've got four girls here to choose from and I've got three boys to choose from. So it says in this case, how many ways are there to select the president and vice president? So there is your vice president bucket and there's your president bucket. If the president is a girl, well, the president's gotta come from this bucket where there's four girls. So there's your president. And the vice president is a boy. Well, because of the fact that it's a girl, you still only have three boys to pick from. So you got three by the same process we just talked about on problem 28. We multiply the two, we end up with 12 options for problem number 29. Let's look at problem number 30 here. It says, what is the next permutation given P equals 256431? Well, let's start out with three and one. Those guys are already in descending order, so there's no flip-flopping that can actually occur. So now, again, if I erase that, now I look at four, three, and one. If I look at four, three, and one, those are listed in descending order. No manipulation to those digits that I can do working from right to left. So again, can't do anything with that. Now I am looking at 6431, utilizing those digits, those are all in descending order. Nothing I can do with 6, 4, 3, and 1. So again, now I've got to work sequentially from right to left. Now I'm looking at 5, 6, 4, 3, 1. These are all not in descending order, so the trigger is going to be to flip the 5 and 6. So 2 is in good shape but I have to utilize the largest number out of that set, which is six. Well, if my digits are one, two, three, four, five, and six, I've used two and I've used six. Now I gotta create out of the remaining digits, the smallest number that can be formed with the remaining digits in this permutation. Hence, so I end up with one, three, four, and five, utilizing 
the digits that were not used. Again, the one, the three, the four, and the five were not used as the next permutation. Completing number 30. Let's look at number 31. We want the x squared y cubed doing a binomial expansion or expansion on 2x minus y uh, raised to the fifth power. So first thing we need to do, we had three columns that we explained back uh, a few weeks ago regarding this. So the first piece of this, if I set up uh, the corresponding uh, chart, if I did the full thing on this, would be five choose zero, five choose one, five choose two, a five choose three, a five choose four, as well as a five choose five. So that's my first column. My second column, we take the first value of 2x, and we're going to use that all the way down here. 2x, 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 and 2x. And for this particular one, we start at 5 and work our way down. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. For the y piece, we have to utilize, again, make sure if it's negative, you carry that through. Negative y to the 0. This one's going to go up. So negative y to the first, negative y to the second, negative y to the third, negative y to the fourth, as well as negative y to the fifth. Okay, so now I am ready to go. I've got my second column created, as well as my third column. So for the first one, 5 choose 0 is 1. And let's see, 2 to the fifth is 32x to the fifth. Anything raised to 0 is 1. So the first term is a 32x to the fifth. 5 choose 1 is 5. 2 to the 4th is 16, so I got a 16x to the 4th. Negative y to the 1st is going to make that a negative y. So if I do, let's see, that term is going to be negative. And let's see, uh, 16 times 5, we got 80. So we've got a minus 80 x to the fourth y. For the third row, 5 choose 2 is 10. 2 cubed is 8, x to the third. Negative y uh, squared, negative times a negative is positive. So we end up with y squared. 10 times 8 is 80, x cubed, y squared. And then 5 choose 3 is 10. And let's see, 2 squared is 4x squared. Negative y cubed, we're going to end up with a minus y cubed. So 10 times 4 times negative 1 makes that a negative 40x squared y cubed. 5 choose 4 is a 5. 2x to the first, that's just simply 2x. And then negative y to the fourth, it's an even power, so we end up with that being a positive on that. So 2 times 5 is 10x y to the fourth. And then the last one, if I did the complete expansion, 5 choose 5 is 1. Anything raised to the 0 is 1 times a negative y to the fifth, which makes that a negative y to the fifth. Now, for this particular problem, all it asked for is what is the coefficient or the number in front of x squared y cubed? So if I come down to the x squared y cubed, the number of the coefficient that's in front of it is negative 40, answering the correct answer to problem number 31. Looking at number 32, conference room has eight tables and 57 chairs. What is the smallest possible number of chairs at that table having the most seats? This is pigeonhole that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. By pigeonhole principle, you apply the ceiling of the division of 57 divided by 8. Well, 
This is going to be 8 goes into 57, 7 point something, whatever it ends up as the calculator. But if I apply the ceiling, we end up with having to go to the right. And that was discussed earlier in the video. Ceiling function, you move the to the right in terms of the number line. So we end up with 8 as our correct answer to problem number 32. All right, let's look at number 33. For number 33, if a coin is tossed four times, what is the probability that it will land tails twice? Well, if you recall when we said the probability of something was calculated by the respective event divided by the cardinality of the sample size. So let's take care of the sample size. Well, you're tossing a coin four times. There's two possible outcomes for each of those. So you end up with a total of 16 different options to determine the denominator. Now, if a coin is tossed four times, that is going to get me two to the fourth, again, 16 options. So if I list out all of them, head, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not going to have enough room. Let me clear that out. Clear out all that. Okay, so let me start this off to the right, kind of a little bit higher, and we'll uh, make sure we get all 16 of them. So, okay, uh, let's see, we got head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Half of eight is four. So head, 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 tail, 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 head, 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 head. And tail, 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 tail. Half of four is two, so head, head, tail, tail, head, head, tail, tail, head, head, tail, tail, head, head, tail, tail. And then last but not least, half of two is one, so head, tail, head, tail, head, tail. Head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail. All right. So if I look at the first line, I'm not going to include it. Let me actually change that to a different color here. Different color. Okay. So for the first line, I'm not going to include it because that's not two tails. That one does not have two tails. That one does not have two tails. That one does. So I'm going to put a check mark by it. Not two tails. That one does have two tails. So check mark by it. That one has two tails. Check mark by it. That one has three tails. Doesn't work. That one does not have three ta uh, two tails on it. This one does. Check mark. That one does. Check mark. That one's got three tails on it. That one's got two tails. So check mark. That one's got three tails on it. Don't use it. That one's got three tails. And the last one has four tails, so I don't use it. So check marks. One, two, three, four, five, six. So in this case, the cardinality of the event would be count again one, two, three four, five, six. So again, probability is determine the respective event over the respective sample size. Sample size was 16, numerator being six, six sixteenths reduces down to three eighths as the correct answer to problem number 33. Okay, for 34, how many edges are there in a graph with the total degrees being 18? This was discussed back week six. Uh, pretty straightforward on this calculation. If you know the total degrees, how many edges is simply taking 
Uh, that 18 and dividing by two, you end up with nine as your correct answer to problem 34. For problem 35, you start out with 19 vertices. I need to know how many edges there are. In this particular case, we subtract one from the vertices. So you get 19 minus one, you end up with 18 as your correct answer to problem number 35. And last but not least, number 36, we're going the other way this time. You start out with 18 edges. I wanna know the vertices this time. You add one to get uh, the amount of vertices. So we end up with 19 as our correct answer to problem number 36. This concludes the review for CS208 discrete mathematics final examination.